So, in Matthew chapter 6, verse 9 through 13, that's where we're going to be. Um, Jesus is t- teaching his disciples about prayer. And uh, he gives them this, th- this prayer that, I mean, pastors preached on it multiple times. There's a lot of books on it. Um, so, I'm not really going to look at it so much as seven different types of prayers that we can learn from this prayer. Okay. Um, these are prayers that are shown throughout the whole Bible. It's just that um, they are all combined into the Lord's Prayer. And so I wanted to look at it. Um, Matthew 6, starting in verse 9, says this. This, then, is how you should pray. Our Father in heaven, hallowed be your name. Your kingdom come and your will be done on earth as it is in heaven. Give us today our daily bread and forgive us our debts as we also have forgiven our debtors. And lead us not into temptation, but deliver us from the evil one. Um, some translations say evil. Uh, the, the more correct uh, translation is evil one. It is talking about Satan, not evil generally. However, I think that evil does still um, fit. So... The first um, prayer is from the first section there. It's, Our Father in heaven, hallowed be your name. And this is a prayer of blessing. Um, This is when you come to God and just simply say, God, you're good. And you just just praise him for who he is. You're you're just blessing him for what he's done in your life. Just for that kind of stuff. Okay, It's a prayer of blessing. You're not asking for anything. You don't have any motives. You're just going uh, to to worship God. Real simple, straightforward. Um, Worshiping God for who He is and what He's done. These two kind of these two ideas are kind of tied together because God always acts according to who He is. He never acts contrary to who He is. So to praise Him for what He's done is the same as to praise Him for who He is, and to praise Him for who He is is to praise Him for who he, what He does. Because, like for instance, God is faithful. That's who He is. So okay, um, if you look there, it says in the second part there, it says, "How would be your name?" Some translations will say maybe uh, blessed be your name, or what, what do your guys' translations say? Um, hallowed. Hallowed? Does anybody have anything besides hallowed on verse 9? Yeah, like holy, right? What? Is that like holy? Hallowed? Yeah, yeah. So I, I was kind of hoping there'd be something with a different, different word there, but yeah, we can just say holy is your name, uh, blessed is your name, that kind of an idea, okay? Um, so in, in the ancient world, name doesn't mean name like it does now. Like, my name is Michael. <laughs> in the ancient world, a name was more of your reputation. And it wasn't your, just your reputation, it was also your family's reputation. Um, and it wasn't just your family's reputation, it was also your character, too. You had to act in accordance with the honor that your family wanted to achieve. You had, and everything you did was was either earned your family honor or, or, or earned them dishonor. And so for, the, for Jesus to, say, to tell his disciples to pray, how would be your name, is to basically praise God for everything that he's ever done. And since God is unchanging, it's to praise his character too. So he's kind of talking about this whole big concept, just summarized by saying, how would be your name. Very, very interesting how the Bible often does that. Like the Gospel of John, uh, I don't know why they tell um, people who just barely get saved to read through the Gospel of John. There's so much more going on in that book than, I mean, it's just so confusing when you first get saved. I mean, I always tell them to start off something simple like Psalms or Luke or something like that. (laughs) Anyways, um, so an interesting thing is sometimes people feel like um, that you can't worship God if you're going through a hard time. But it's the exact opposite. When you're going through a hard time, that's all the, all that makes your worship all the more genuine. Does that, does that kind of make sense? Because how do I want to say that? Because it's easy to say, "Lord, I love you," when you're not going through a trial. When you are going through a trial and you don't feel like praising God, and you still choose to praise God, even though you don't feel like it, even though you are having doubts in your faith, even though you kind of just want to give up. That is what makes praise really praise. Mm, yeah. It would have been really easy for Job to say, hey, in good times or bad times, you know, hey, I'll worship you, God. But then when the rubber met, met the road, it actually gave opportunity for Job to really say, will I not bless God in good and bad? Mm-hmm. It gave opportunity for that. 
So, um, as God, been with each of these seven prayers I'm going to look at, it raises a foundational question in the core of our being. And this prayer, the prayer of blessing God, asks, asks this question, is God always worthy of my respect, honor, and obedience? Is there ever a situation, is there ever a situation when I don't have to obey God, when I don't have to respect Him, when, I have, when, I, when it's okay for me to have a bad attitude towards God and what He's doing? And that is at the core of giving a prayer of blessing to God. Because you have to say, no, God, no. I am not going to disobey you just because you're not acting how, how I want you to act. Mm -hmm. It's a big statement. Mm -hmm. So that takes us to our second uh, prayer. And if you're following along here in your Bibles, that would take us to verse 10. Your kingdom come, your will be done on earth as it is in heaven. So this is more of a prayer of submission. Surrendering your dreams, your hopes, what you want to happen. What you think should happen. What, how you want your life to play out. Submission is basically a, a big word that means who's boss. <laughs> and it's about giving it to God, whatever that thing is. Family problems, like I already said, dreams, something that you were struggling with that you just never seemed to get victory over, whatever that thing is, giving it to God. That's what this prayer is about. In all these things, Lord, your kingdom come, your will be done. Not, not what I want, but what you want. This is what I have planned for my future, but your kingdom come. Your will be done. It's, it, it takes us from what's natural to us. You know, nobody has to teach us to watch out for ourselves. We do that all by ourselves from birth. We are born with just a, a desire within us to always watch out for ourselves all the time. You don't have to teach me to be selfish. But with this prayer, it goes completely contrary and says, your will be done. Now that's hard to do when people have mistreated you, mm -hmm. when people aren't doing what you want to happen, and you think the situation that you're in is just plain stupid. Mm -hmm. Well, then, then to still say, you know, your kingdom come, your will be done, that's a big step. It involves sacrificing what's best for you for what's best for God. And that is a difficult thing, because there's a part of us that wants to hold on to us. Lord, I will surrender my life to you except for this thing. And we all have our own thing. For some people, it's finances. I mean, some people love money more than anything else. For some people, it's relationships. You know, they, they just don't think they can live life without that person in their life or whatever. You know, there's a lot of different examples, but I think you guys can probably draw your own conclusions. Everybody has that one thing. That one thing that they just have a really hard time surrendering to God. And it is a conscious effort of killing your claim of Godhood on your life, and instead transferring ownership back to God where it came from. Um, it is actively wanting what God wants. Now, I want you guys to just really, really, really quickly stop and ask yourself, is, are there areas in my life that I'm not wanting what God is wanting? Don't, don't answer. Just, just think. Is there an area of my life? And I want you to be honest with yourself because you're not, you're not, this isn't like you're, you're not confessing to the groom. But just be honest with yourself and start, start seriously thinking about this. And if you can't think of anything, I want you to this week just go to, go to God in prayer and say, Lord, can you show me something that I'm not act actively wanting what you want in this area? And I almost promise you that God's going to show you something because we can always grow. So the big question that this, that this prayer asks in our problem is, this is who I am. Why should I not get or do what I want? Why should I not get or do what I want? That's a big, hard question. I mean, that's something that it's just, it's just hard to not get your way. I mean, spend a couple days with toddlers. Well, once you get older, do you think you suddenly just stop having those problems? <laughs> you don't. <laughs> you keep fighting the same battles, it seems like. It's like, oh man, I remember when I was a kid and I had the same fight with my dad. You know what I mean? So, okay. Um, so it's, it's uh, for, uh, the two examples I wrote down here, the first one is credit card. You know, am I going to spend what I have money for and what I need or what I want? Rack up a bunch of credit card debt because I want it instead of trusting God to give me what I need when I need it. See the difference there? Mm -hmm. See the transfer of ownership? 
We, we, we oftentimes use credit cards as an excuse to not let God have our finances. Now, I don't think that credit cards are wrong. I think that credit cards used immorally are wrong. And when we start covering over our, our, our need for a heart transplant <laughs> with credit cards, that's the problem. Um, and then another one is relationships, but I already mentioned that, so I don't really want to beat a dead horse. So the third prayer, the first one was our Father in heaven, hallowed be your name. The second one was your kingdom come, your will be done on earth as it is in heaven. Okay, so then that takes us to the third one, which is providence, which is provision. God is provider. Um, and that is in verse 11. Give us today our daily bread. So I hope that you're seeing that Jesus is really saying a lot of different things in this short, compact prayer. He's really saying a lot of different things. Mm -hmm. And there's a lot of things that, that, that God said, that Jesus said kind of with this attitude. Those who want to hear will keep seeking. Those who don't want to hear won't even listen to the bare minimum that I gave them. You see it all throughout the law, for instance. For instance like we're, we're, we're in the law, if a man uh, had sex with a virgin, he had to try and marry her. Now, a common misconception is that she had to marry him. She didn't have to marry him. The father could say no, and she could say no too. That's not known because it's not said in the Bible specifically, but that was the culture of the ancient world. So you can't really take, a, take the whole law out of the Old Testament. Well, let's just, let's just get back on track here. Uh, actually, I'm going to forego that point because that's a whole other discussion. And <laughs> Nicole has been working with me about staying on point for my lessons, and I feel myself going off. We're going to go right back. Right back. Okay. Talking about God, God as provider. Uh, give us today our daily bread. So not for what we want, but what we need. There's a world of difference between the things in life that we Think will make us happy. Mm -hmm. And the things in life that God wants us to have. There's a world of difference between those two things. For instance, God wants us to have his word. God wants us to read it and to meditate on it, to, 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 to memorize it, to, to, to be in the word. But oftentimes, we don't even read our Bible throughout the week. See the difference of perspective between what God wants and what we want? <laughs> Well, we think if we don't have Netflix or Hulu or whatever, that we're just, we're in bad shape. Meanwhile, God says, hey, you should be spending your time and money more wisely than that. <laughs> See what I mean? I'm not saying that Netflix is wrong. You know, I, I, we have Netflix at our house. I'm, I'm not saying that at all. I, my point is ownership. That's my point. So, um, in this prayer is something that I feel like oftentimes in America we kind of neglect, and that's the idea that we are constantly dependent on God. American culture really, really, really prizes the idea of independence. Mm -hmm. That you don't have to owe anybody any, anything, which is a good thing, you should own people things, but kind of like you don't need people, like you can just kind of make it on your own. And the Bible teaches the exact opposite. First off, it teaches that, the, that Christians should be dependent on, an, on one another. Not that, not that you shouldn't pay your bills. You should be paying your bills and that kind of stuff. But we try and do our spiritual walk by ourselves. Mm -hmm. I'm going through a struggle and I don't, need, I don't need you guys. I can just do it by myself. So there's no interdependence there. But then the second part of the interdependence that I'm talking about is between us and God. Where we just, God, help me to have a steady supply of money so I don't have to worry about it. And I don't have to keep praying for your will. And I can just forgo the whole praying for you to give me my bread for today. I can just skip that whole battle because I will have had some stored up and problem solved. See, that's what we want to live. We want to live a life that has no trials. And God oftentimes has different plans than that. So instead of having the mindset of storing up, having the mindset of depending on God. Give us today our daily bread. Notice that Jesus never said, give us next month, next month's bread. He said, give us today our daily bread. Don't live in tomorrow. To live in yesterday, live in today. Um, and a, a lot more can be said on that, and has been said on that and on many books, so I'm not going to. Um, it's not what we think we need to happen. In, a, in our situations, how many times do we have all the answers? Mm -hmm. We give God a list of how he needs to answer it. And if he doesn't answer in our timing and in our way, we just throw a fit. Well, God didn't answer. That's not the God I know. Maybe he didn't answer yet. 
Maybe he didn't answer in the way that you wanted him to. But the God that I know does answer. That, that's the one that's in the Bible. The one that followed Abraham's concubine out into the desert just to give her a little bit of hope and to guide her back to the water. That's the God that I know. See, I mean, people get this idea that, oh, God doesn't answer because he didn't answer yet. Well, I didn't know God was on a time limit. <laughs> you know, there's this movie, Lord of the Rings, and there's this wizard on it, his name's Gandalf, and he says, I, pr I arrive precisely when I mean to. And that's, that's God. He arrives precisely when he means to. It may not be what we want, but that's how he works. He's not subject to us. We are subject to him. That takes us back to prayer number two, submission. See, he, he said prayer number two before he got to this one, didn't he? So, okay, that, this asks a very foundational um, question. Is God as good as he says he is? Yes. <clears throat> that is a root of a lot of our problems. Some people are afraid to go to heaven because they're afraid of what it will be like. Because in the back of their mind, there's that doubt. Is God really as good as he says that he is? Some people are afraid of death because they have that question. Is God as good as he says it is? And we mask it with other things. You know, like, oh, I don't doubt God's goodness. I just don't know for sure if I'm going to be able to make ends meet. Isn't that kind of what we're talking about here? Now, I'm not, let me just clarify something. I'm not talking about going out and spending your money foolishly. And wasting it on a bunch of nonsense. And then saying, God, I don't have any money for rent this month. I'm not talking about that. You are expected to handle your money wisely. Proverbs, the whole book talks about that. Mm -hmm. So I'm not going to. But, on the flip side of that, there is a certain level of depending on God as provider. As provider. In the book of Exodus, God gives his name as I Am. And throughout, people have wondered, what does that name mean? Well, the rest of the book of Exodus tells us what it means. He is the God who redeems Israel. He is the God who gives bread in the desert. He is the, that he showed the rest of the book what he is. He gave I am, that's, that's who I am. And then he went through the rest of the book showing the applications. I am as you need me to be, as I call you to what I've called you to be. That is who God is. And once again, his name is just, you cannot separate from his character. So, takes us to the fourth one, confession. Ooh boy, this is, this is one that we don't really like. And forgive us our debts. And we're not go, don't go to the next part of it because that's something else, okay? Forgive us our debts. Confessing our sins to God. Sometimes we have this idea. When somebody does me wrong, I'd rather just brush it under the table and move on. Well, that's fine. That's fine. But that's not how God works. Like, if, if that's how you handle your problems with people and, and you and, and that other person, that's how you guys have resolved the issue, whatever, as long as you guys have resolved the issue, whatever. But God tells us to confess our sins to him. Well, I, I just did this yesterday. I just did this earlier today. Confess your sins to God. That's what he told us to do. It's his direction for life. Now, what happens when we do that? Well, first off, it helps us to get victory over the thing that we're struggling with. And second off, it allows us to be ushered into a form of praise and worship with God that is impossible otherwise. Impossible otherwise. But another thing about this is that when you, when you pray, forgive us our debts, you are asking God to reveal the hardness of your heart. What I mean by that, well, let's say you're... You, let's say you don't think that you have anything wrong right now. So you say, Lord, forgive, forgive me my debts. Forgive me what I've done wrong. I'm pretty good. Well, then as you sit, stay in prayer, God shows you things. You know, you've been doing this. You know, and he'll show you one. He'll, he, God's not one of those, God's not like one of those nagging old women who just like constantly tell you everything that wrong that you're doing. But he will bring something by. He will bring something by and show you. You know what I mean? Um, and it also involves consciously stopping living your own way and sinning. Because when you're saying, um, forgive us our debts, forgive me, forgive me for the sin that I'm doing, it is impossible to continue to pray that prayer honestly if you do not stop doing the thing that you're doing. Now, I'm not saying you're going to get it overnight. It will be a battle. But there is that aspect of 
so stop doing it. <laughs> when, I, I'm going to go rob a bank tonight, and, you know, God forgive me for that. How about stop robbing the bank? <laughs> this isn't rocket science. So this, this prayer brings up a very important question. Am I good enough to not need God? Am I good enough to not need God? Every one of us at one point in our life, could be tomorrow, could be next week, could be in a month, could be in a year, will have at least a passing feeling of, I'm better than them. I may have been wrong, but they were more wrong. God, I might have messed up, but I stopped doing it. Saying, see, what I'm, see what I'm getting at here? And sometimes we're not always aware of what we're doing wrong mm -hmm. and how we're hiding sin from God. And the worst part about it is we kind of build ourselves up like, hey, I'm doing pretty good. And right, right when you, that thought enters your mind, you need, to, you need to be spending time in prayer and fasting. As soon as that thought enters into your mind that, hey, I'm doing all right. I'm doing all right. Be on your guard about that. So then the fifth one is the second part of verse 12. It says, as we also have forgiven our debtors. So this is this, this prayer, the prayer for, for God to help us to forgive others. That's a difficult thing. Have you ever just stopped and asked yourself, how do I forgive them? I hate them so much. They've hurt me so bad. How do I forgive them? That's what this prayer is all about. It's literally asking God to change your heart, to change your attitude, to heal what is not good there in that situation. Even if the person or situation doesn't change, even if they keep doing the bad thing, that's not even in this prayer as we also have forgiven our debtors. But they didn't stop doing it. As we also have forgiven our debtors. You are literally asking God to change your heart, your attitude, your attitude problem. That's hard to do. And it's also abandoning your claim on the wrong suffered. It's saying, I don't have the right I don't have the right to take up the fence when this person hurt me. I don't have that right. God has forgiven me, so as a result, he now holds the claim on my life. That means I don't have a right to hold on to that bitterness and that grudge. I have to give it up. And just to make sure that we're all clear on this, if you hop down to verse 14, it says this, For if you forgive other people when they sin against you, your heavenly Father will also forgive you. And in case you still haven't gotten it, he clarifies further in verse 15. But if you do not forgive others their sin, your Father will not forgive your sins. Because not forgiving somebody means that you have not transferred ownership over to God. You are still the God of you. Because you are still claiming to have the power to hold on to a hurt. So in this, we, it asks a very important question. Do I have to treat others with love, especially if they've hurt me? Isn't it good enough that I know that God loves me and, and he's, you know, he's, he's died for me and I just love that and, you know, can't I just be good with that and just separate myself from people so they won't hurt me anymore? Can't I just avoid, avoid them so they won't hurt me and, and I can just go through life happy? Can't I just not go to church because they're just full of a bunch of loudmouth hypocrites and all they do is hurt people? Can't I just, can't I just be happy and alone? Do I have to treat others with love? The sign of maturity as a Christian is not how much you know, it's how much you serve. James says this in chapter 1 when he, when he talks about the true sign of religion being serving widows, orphans. Paul talks about it a lot too, but that's a whole other thing that I've actually already preached a few months ago. Um, the sixth prayer, Matthew 6, 13, once again, only the first line, and lead us not into temptation. And this involves our willingness to be told what to do in life by God and others. E. Because God oftentimes uses others to wear a character in our eyes. Are you teachable? Can people tell you what to do? If you have a boss at work, can they tell you what to do? 
if you are, I, I hope you're involved in the church. <laughs> if you, you're here, so obviously you go to church, uh, can, can the pastor say something to you to help you grow, or are you going to instantly take up offense and just give up there? See what I mean? Do you have a willingness to be told what to do by God and others, and lead us not into temptation? Because what we do is we live our own life, and then we lead ourselves down bad roads because we made decisions based on our will. And so then, we lead ourselves into temptation. So we're saying, God, lead us not into temptation. In other words, Jesus, take the will. <laughs> I'm transferring this over to you. <laughs> You're in control here. Teach me before you have to take drastic steps. That's, in essence, what he's saying here. Lead us not into temptation. Well, why would God lead us into temptation unless... He was leading us through the trials because we weren't listening the first time around. See, sometimes God has to lead us through things to get us to pay attention to something that he's trying to say. Well, he didn't try. Okay, what have people been talking to you about? Well, they, they've been talking to me about how I need to stop spending so much money on my credit card. Okay, so then what is the situation entirely involving? My finances. Do you think that the two could be connected, possibly? See what I mean? Now, I'm not saying every single time you go through something, it's going to be, you know, God is bringing by a trial, but I will say this. Excuse me. That God will use anything. And God will use everything. So teach me before you have to take drastic measures. Alter my course. Can I, and that brings up the question in our lives, can I trust God with my future and my life? Can I really trust him with my tomorrow? That's a very important question, especially, especially for those of you under the ages of 40. It's really a question that comes up a lot. Now, older people have a whole other set of questions that I wish I could spend more time on, but you know, when you get older, you just kind of, your perspective on things changes. You know, when, when you're a kid, all you think about is your future and, and how you're gonna change the whole world, and then you get older and you kind of, Maybe not necessarily lose enthusiasm so much as kind of gain perspective and... Well, you guys know what I'm talking about. Mm -hmm. So can I trust God with my future and my life? Is, can I do that? And that brings us to the seventh prayer, the prayer of restoration, but deliver us from the evil one. And I want to broaden this past just Satan. When you pray a prayer like this, Lord, deliver me from the evil one. It can be expanded to say, Lord, deliver me from this evil situation, too. I mean, you see that all throughout the book of Psalms. Lord, deliver me from this. I, I, the, the, the enemy, my enemies are all around me. I, I, I'm being flooded against by the, by the enemy. You could expand this very easily to say, the, say uh, the evil situation. Times of physical, spiritual, or mental suffering. You know, you, there will be times in your life when you are not physically well. That doesn't mean that you have to give up. There will be times, or people, or sometimes an entire lifetime, where you will struggle with mental, mental problems. There, that will happen to people. It's also asking for relief from Satan's attacks. Lord, I'm in this, and I just need you to restore to me the joy of my salvation. Remind me of your goodness. Remind me of your promises. Remind me that this was worth it. Remind me that this was worth it. The prayer of restoration. Regardless of the cause of your problems, it is a spiritual battle. See, the, one of the biggest problems with uh, why, why, when people misunderstand spiritual warfare, they kind of <clears throat> divide it into these two faulty ideas of is it a spiritual attack or is it not a spiritual attack? Well, it... Not everything is called, caused by Satan, or, you know, little demons or gremlins under the table or something. But everything is a spiritual attack, in a way. Because, like, let, let's take, for instance, let's take, for instance, you have a death in the family. No, no demonic attack. They just died. It was their time. God moved them from one plane of existence to the next. <clears throat> okay? So... Is that going to be a spiritual battle for you? Yes, because you have to learn how to live your life without that person in it. That is the definition of a spiritual battle. <laughs> that is a hard thing to do. To say goodbye to someone that you weren't ready to say goodbye to. That's hard. 
So regardless of the cause of your problems, it is a spiritual battle because you still have to trust God in it. You still have to learn and grow from it. You know what Job's sin was? His great sin? He loved God. <laughs> I mean, he didn't do anything wrong. He just loved God. And he had to face all kinds of crap. I mean, <laughs> do you know how, what Abraham did to earn God's favor? Nothing. God just picked some random nomad out in the desert and said, Hey, you. You are the one I'm going to bless. He didn't do anything to deserve that. It's also praying for a victory over our addictions and our habits that are ruling our lives. Deliver us from the evil one. Deliver us from this evil thing that, that is so entangled us. And Hebrews even says it like this, this sin that so easily entangles. And I know Pastor references that verse all the time. So that brings up a very important question. Is God powerful enough even to bail me out of this one? See, if we just stop and ask like that, is God powerful enough? We know the answer. Of course God is. But then when we actually face things in our life, somewhere between here and here, we forget that God is able. We just somehow forget. And we always have to remind ourselves to not doubt the power of God. So it's just something that we always need. So just a real quick summary of, of, the, of the seven prayers I mentioned that each ask a, a very important question of who is our God. The first one was the prayer of blessing where we're just praising God for who he is and what he's done. The second one was the prayer of submission where we're giving up what we want for what God wants. The third one was the prayer of providence that we're praying that God would, would, would provide. We we're depending on God. The fourth one was the prayer of confession, where we are um, confessing what we have done wrong and, and stopping sinning. We're turning from the thing that we're doing. We're focusing in on God. And even though we will still mess up, even though that we will still sin, we are still taking that to God and saying, Lord, please help me through this thing that I'm, that I'm, that I'm failing at, that I'm not, that I'm not <laughs> getting. The only difference between a Christian and a sinner is that the Christian is washed by the blood of Jesus, and the sinner is not. That's the only difference. It's not like here we are up here looking down on the world. That's just totally wrong. Jesus is the only part of the equation that has changed. And then the Holy Spirit does do a work in our hearts, and he does change us over time. But it's a process that takes time. It takes time. In fact, John says it like this. If anyone says that they are without sin, they are a liar. I think that that should tell us that no, we will not reach perfection in this life. So then the fifth prayer is the prayer of forgiveness, that we would learn how to not hold the harm that other people do to us. And the sixth one was the prayer of guidance, that we would learn to follow God's leading instead of our own passions. And the seventh one was the prayer of restoration, that God would give us victory, that God would, would not leave us in the slump hole that we find ourselves in. And it's all bundled up, seven very valuable prayers that are scattered throughout the whole Bible that Jesus just takes and combines into one prayer. Really, really a, a very cool thing. So I, uh, I want to leave you guys with two questions that I do not want you guys to answer. I do not want you guys to answer at all. I want you guys to think about this. The first one, which of the seven prayers do you neglect? If there are multiple ones, uh, find somewhere to write that down. And what I want you to do is I want you to consciously this week to pray those prayers that you're not praying. If you're not praising God as much as you should, take the time this week to pray. If you're not confessing your sins to God, take the time this week to confess your sins to God. It, 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 see what I mean? It, take the time to grow this week. And then the second question, do your prayers focus more on others or yourself? I'm not trying to convict you. I just want you to be real with yourself. and to kind of, Because in answering that question, it's going to help you to see where you're headed spiritually. It doesn't mean that you're in a bad place. But typically, people who focus too much on themselves eventually end up in a bad place spiritually. Just typically. So we're going to go ahead and close there. You can go ahead and turn it off. Um, can I have uh, Joe?